This is Afternoons with Sonia Feldhoff. Sonia. On 891 ABC Adelaide and local radio. Well, for many people, if I just mention the Summerton Man, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. The Summerton Man is a, a, a decades-long mystery about what happened to a man around his mid-40s whose body was found on Summerton Beach. Um, what year was it? 1948. So it's some um, almost 70 years later that we are still trying to work out who this man was, what happened to him, what his backstory was. It was found in an autopsy that he died of poisoning, I believe. Many people have tried to work out the identity of this man and uh, the the work behind the scenes continues. And I guess that has stepped up recently with the arrival in Australia of Dr Colleen Fitzpatrick, a forensic genealogist visiting from the US. We'll find out what she thinks about this case and whether she thinks she can perhaps shed some light onto this or, or what's needed to do that. But first, a man who has been... Uh, following this case and trying to find out more information for a very long time is Professor Derek Abbott from the Centre for Biomedical Engineering at the University of Adelaide. Professor, nice to talk with you again. G'day. Um, Derek, you just work behind the scenes trying to get more information on this this enigma in South Australia, this mystery. Um, you've been trying to get permission to have the body exhumed to try to establish some DNA links. Have you made any progress on that score? On uh, getting permission for the exhumation? Yes. Uh, not as yet, no. Do you think that you're close to finding some new information that might persuade the Attorney General, whose responsibility I think it is to decide that? Uh well, one of the things I'm trying to send out feelers for to the Attorney General is to find out what he uh, actually requires and needs, because that's actually not clear. Why are um, you so committed to exhuming him? What do you think that we could find out from that information? Okay, uh, and this is something, of course, Colleen can comment on more. But basically, there are a number of things that can be done with an exhumation. One can um, extract DNA uh, from his bones and teeth, for example. And as Colleen will explain to you from his DNA, we can find out clues as to his ancestry and uh, trace those to living relatives. And she has done uh, similar things uh, for US cases, which she will explain to you. The other thing, other things we can do other than DNA are, are what are called a bone isotope test. And uh, a bone isotope test actually uh, tells you where somebody was born. So this would be a very critical bit of information for nailing this guy's uh, history and his identity. Because there, are there was other... some talk that he was a, a Russian, some even say a Russian spy, but certainly of um, Russian background. Uh, that, there are some people that um, uh, have those theories, but uh, that's by no means certain at all. Derek, the um, what do we know about the Summerton Man? Okay, uh, we we know some interesting facts about him. Uh, we know he was um, somewhere around forty to forty-five years old, so that would pl uh, make place his birth date as the early 1900s. Um, we know he was an extremely fit person. He had um, almost an athletic physique. And um, we have uh, managed to extract some DNA from one of his hairs because some samples of hair do exist in the police museum. Uh, but the concentration levels aren't enough to do the sort of thing Colleen needs to do. But we were able to determine his maternal um, uh, DNA type. Uh, it's called uh, Group H, so he's from a Group H, which doesn't really tell you much because 40% 40, 40 of Europeans are all Group H, so it tells you he's from a European background, which isn't much of a surprise because mm, mm. he looks like that anyway. Um, but it tells you there is viable DNA there, so I think that's a big tick of the box straight away. Yeah, keep going. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, that's all right. Uh, the, uh, there are other interesting clues about the guy. Uh, he has very unusual ears. 
and the upper hollow of his ear is much larger than the normal population. So that's another identity marker. And if we do find uh, putative uh, relatives, this is uh, a possible thing to check whether they have similar ears or not. Also, he had um, two of his front teeth were missing, the ones that are next to the middle teeth. Uh, yet he had no gaps there. So that's uh, because it's symmetrical on, and on both sides. It is suggestive that that was a congenital condition. And so uh, it's possible that uh, relatives in his line would may also have that condition as well. So that's another big clue. Another interesting sort of circumstantial thing is he seemed to have a number of items on him that were American. Um, his tie was American, and uh, his jacket he was wearing was American. He had an aluminium comb in his pocket, which was said to be American at the time, because that was quite rare in Australia, and a number of other things. So one wonders if um, he's either had contact with the USA or is, is American, or, pers or possibly he bought the stuff second, second hand off a, an American GI here in Australia. We, we don't know. But there are some odd things, like he had chewing gum in his pocket, a little bit American there, you know, for an Australian adult to chew gum. So possibly there's a bit of a clue there. I'm talking with Professor Derek Abbott from the Centre for Biomedical Engineering at the University of Adelaide about the Somerton Man. Let's introduce into this Dr Colleen Fitzpatrick, who is a forensic genealogist visiting from the US. Colleen, good afternoon and, and welcome to Adelaide. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us. Now, you have a very um, uh, illustrious career identifying people um, who, who other people have struggled with. Um, can you uh, tell us about this Abraham Lincoln project you're working with just firstly because that, that fascinates me and shows me that it doesn't matter how much time's gone past, you really can make um, some interesting discoveries. Yes, I'd like to clarify first that all of the projects I worked on are team efforts and it's not me that identified the you know anyone, it's the group normally. You know, it's a usually I work with a, a team or a group of very, very well um, people with great expertise in their various fields, whether it's ancient DNA or fingerprint analysis. So let me just say that whatever projects I worked on, I've worked with some very nice and very professional types that have done their jobs very well. So in terms of Abraham Lincoln, I'm working with Dr. Zach Spiegelman, who's at Tufts University, Dr. Ann Stone from University of um, Arizona, and Adrian Briggs, who's also at Harvard, who's at Harvard right now. And so uh, the whole point of that started out with whether Lincoln had uh, genetic disorders. And to establish that, you really need a cop some sample of his genome. Um, his body is buried in cement. It had been moved 17 times or so you know, between the time he died in the early 1900s. So his family had him entombed in cement. So you know, his remains are not available for testing. Okay, so that being said, you really need some relics, Lincoln relics, and of course, by the way, today is the 150th anniversary of his death. Um, he uh, bears quite a few relics with blood on them in various museums and historical societies in America, but to really use those to have a sample of his genome, you have to authenticate them. And to authenticate them, you need to find a family member who, to which, who could donate DNA um, to serve as a reference against which those relics can be compared. And that's where someone like myself comes in, a forensic genealogist who has skills in tracing very difficult to prove family lines. We understand kinship and relationship analysis and the um, level of proof required to establish human identity. So that's what I do, and that's where my part is to try and find his family. And it's not easy because he was the only, he has no living descendants. His brother and sister died uh, without issue. So he was essentially an only child, that, the only child that had any children. Uh, and then uh, when you go back to his mother's level, um, you have to use the maternal line for various reasons. Um, nobody's really sure where his mother came from, uh, who her relatives were. So um, that's my challenge. That's part, the, my part of the challenge mm. to 
try and establish that family line. It's interesting, though, because you say you're starting with the the, the blood for, on some of the relics. In the case we're talking about here with the Somerton man, we're working backwards, aren't we? We've got people who may be descendants, but no way of proving that. Correct. You have to find uh, some some DNA from the Somerton man himself, and that's the... The, the challenge Dr. Abbott has to try and, you know, get the authorities to agree to exhume him because, of course, that's the best sample you can get. I do believe that there will, the remains will yield DNA for several reasons. But, of course, you have all kinds of eventualities that, you know, may come up that will prevent that from happening because, of course, DNA is a very complex molecule and sometimes it's hard to predict what, it will, what the effects of the environment will be on it. So... Um, it remains to be seen if DNA can be extracted, but I, I think it's highly likely it can be. And, and how long is that possible for? Um, well, like, is there a time frame on this? Not, not really, because the unknown child in the Titanic, for example, died in 1912. Now, for, for those who aren't aware, you helped identify this unknown child. <laughs> yes, uh, I was part of that Part team. of the team. Yeah, so... Um, yes, that do- baby died in 1912. Um, DNA from his remains were extracted maybe 1999. Um, so that's 80 years there. And then it took, once you have the DNA extracted, of course, then you can amplify it and process it. So, you know, those were 80-year-old remains in Halifax, which is very rainy, it has a high degree of acid rain, very damp, rainy, and cold. So, um, you know, you have to say that that's extraordinary. And, of course... Here in Adelaide, the climate is much milder and warmer and drier. So um, I would think that the Somerton man being approximately, what is it, 70 or so mm. years old since his burial, I think that there's a, a good chance that there'll be viable DNA still available. Is, what are you aware of as to what has been left of the Somerton man? Is there nothing there that, that may offer you that, that connection, that DNA link? Well, we really don't know to we exhume him, but I would imagine that his teeth, the enamel is the hardest substance in the human body. And quite frequently when somebody's exhumed and DNA analysis is done on his remains, the first thing you, you know, the lab would look at is the teeth. And if the teeth are intact, that means the enamel's intact. That means the enamel has been protecting the dentin, which has the potential of yielding DNA. Now, if the teeth have, you know, you have 32 teeth, so there's quite a, um, or in his case, 30, so, you know, there's quite a, one of those teeth almost certainly could yield DNA. But even so, if something happened to that, um, the next thing is to look at DNA from the long bones, like the femur um, or, you know, one of the long bones of the arm. So, um, it, you know, I think that there's a high chance there'll be mm. DNA, but you don't know until you actually look. You're a forensic genealogist. What is it about the Somerton man story that, that so interests you that you've been willing to come out and take a look? Well, it's just the mystery. You know, it's just the mystery of human identity. Um, I, am, I have done some very difficult adoption searches, and the person before they find their birth parents and the person afterwards are completely different. You know, they go to work, same job, same clothes, same food, but they're completely different in some kind of really deep way. So in the, on the other side, you see family members that have, have finally, you know, brought, you brought closure to family members. You know, if you find their adopted child, the unidentified remains belong to their families. So there's a human side to it, that, you know, from the family's point of view, that they want closure too. So what attracts me is reuniting the people and seeing the transformation when they see the closure and they know what happened and they know where their loved one is. With the passing of time, though, we're talking about some 70 years um, in this case in particular. Who who drives that? Who has the right to ask for that? Who who funds it even, uh, the sort of work that you do, Colleen? Um, it really depends. Uh, Lincoln, you know, we had, not that we are exhuming him, but Lincoln, that was, uh, some of that was sponsored by um, a production company that we were working for, for one of the channels um, in United States. Um, that's not really common, but they were very interested in the story. Um, some of the, uh, like the work on the unknown child was all pro bono because people really invested their time um, in the project. Um, so, you know, it's a high profile project and everybody's very interested in it. So like the DNA lab was, you know, devoting their 
you know, employees' time to it, and I devoted my time to searching out some of the relatives. And really, there were hundreds of genealogists from all over the world during the period of maybe eight to ten years that this required to make the identification. So really, most of the high-level cases are pro bono. Um, not to say it wouldn't be nice to have a grant um, to do some of this work. I know the Lincoln Project, we're pursuing grants at the moment because we'd like to do a lot more extensive DNA testing. And of course, you know, we have to probably pay for that. There's a limit to what the lab can do. And it would be a very, probably very extensive testing we'd like to do. So um, in general, the, the projects are pro bono, but you know, we do seek grants when it's possible and available because you know, it's always nice to get paid for the work you do, yes, even I'm if sure it's it interesting. I'm talking with Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, a forensic genealogist visiting from the U.S., and she's here in Adelaide, um, interested in the, the mystery of the Summerton Man, which many here in South Australia would be familiar with. He went missing in 1948. And Colleen will be presenting two talks tonight for Genealogy SA at 7 o'clock at the Unley Uniting Church Hall. Um, one of them is how DNA can help you with your family tree. The other is the secrets, the secrets of Abraham Lincoln's DNA, which we've touched on briefly. If you'd like to know more, uh, you might want to attend those talks tonight. There is a little bit of a small, uh, just a small fee to attend, but if you want to go along, she certainly is very interesting to to hear from. Uh, Colleen, where to, where to from here? Because when it comes to DNA, we've seen. DNA used in many court cases, and they talk about, um, you know, it, it was the sort of saviour to a lot of cases in many ways. And then we found out that, that maybe it wasn't always as reliable. Um, what's your attitude to the reliability of DNA these days? Um, well, I feel the labs have greatly improved. They, they have very advanced techniques. Um, and I, I, as far as reliability, I have no question that the results are reliable. Um, of course, as far as the interpretation of those results, you know, we're getting better and better at that too. Uh, Derek mentioned hap group H and ethnic background, and um, that's based on large databases, scientific databases that have been created um, characterizing the DNA of various ethnicities or nationalities. And as those become more complete, then of course any, any comparison to those uh, databases becomes more accurate. So my feeling is that it's well worth it. You know, we're, if it didn't work, there wouldn't be so many hundreds of thousands of genealogists that have gotten their DNA tested. And so, you know, even if, say, someone doubts the, you know, just the scientific stuff, well, it's so popular that if it wasn't, you know, at all accurate or worth it, then nobody would be pursuing it. There wouldn't be the commercial market there is for genetic genealogy, but there is. And I do believe in the, in the, that it will work. Well, Colleen, we may see you back here if there's ever approval given to um, exhume the Summerton Man and find out more about it. Okay, that'd be great. I'd love to come. Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick is a forensic genealogist visiting from the US. As I said, she'll be talking tonight at the Unley Uniting Church Hall on the secrets of Abraham Lincoln's DNA and how DNA can help you with your family tree if you'd like to attend. Um, just let's finish up with Professor Derek Abbott from the University of Adelaide. As you continue looking into this, Professor, um, do you think, uh, what's the value, do you think, for people 70 years after this body was found in, in finding out more about this man and who he was? What public value is there in doing that? Or is it simply for those two, I think, women who, who believe they're descended? Um, I think um, there is a value for, the, for uh, possible descendants. And also there are possible descendants that we don't know about out there in the world who also need closure. So that, those are two key things there. Another key thing for the general community, um, I think there's, there's a benefit there too. Uh, because this is uh, like a cold case, it's still open. Uh, there's been hundreds of inquiries to the police over, say, uh, since, since all the years since 1948 and you know they do have better things to do with their time uh, they have more pressing cases so it takes the the burden off the public in infrastructure to be able to give this uh, closure so it uh, saves money as well uh, so there's 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 all sorts of different ways to look at this Indeed. Look, Professor, thank you so much for your time today. Professor Derek Abbott from the Centre for Biomedical Engineering at the University of 
Adelaide.